Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I am in the Napa Valley with John Scoopney, the winemaker and proprietor of Lang and Reed in Napa Valley. John, welcome to Wine Soundtrack, and tell us about Lang and Reed. Well, thank you, Allison. It is a lovely day here, spring day in Napa Valley. Yes. Um, Lang and Reed was simply uh, born from uh, sort of the inspiration of my wife and I trying to figure out what we would do next, um, what really excited us and what the passion of wine had brought to us. We had both been in the trade for many years beforehand, at least 10 to 15 years, first in the restaurant business and then living here in California working for wineries. And one day we decided that perhaps we should start to make wine for ourselves. And the inspiration came about that we had working for other wineries here in Napa Valley, a bit was very Cabernet Sauvignon centric, but yet we'd had the opportunity to taste barrel samples of all the Bordeaux blending grapes. And um, one of them kept rising to the top for us and seemed to be underappreciated here in Napa Valley, which was Cabernet Franc. So we kind of took that as a lead that, well, maybe we could make an important uh, statement about Cabernet Franc. One of the best parts of it was the fact that there was so little being made specifically to be bottled as Cabernet Franc that sort of the, the world was un, unlimited for us. There, of course, were classic places to look at where Cabernet Franc was being made, and we could be inspired by that, but we knew that we couldn't, we couldn't replicate that, and that wasn't really our desire. And uh, I was trained as an artist in painting and printmaking, and it gave me a palette that allowed me to not be constricted by people's preconception of what Napa Valley Cabernet Franc was gonna be like. Hmm. So while I was working for the Coppola family in the early 90s, um, I secured a couple tons of grapes. I was working with Tony Soder at the Coppola's. He was our consulting winemaker. And through a lot of sort of intellectual decisions and many multiple bottles of wine, he and I agreed uh, that he would let me make my first wines at his uh, winery down in Napa called A2. Um, this was before the big facility. This was what we called Soder Home on Big Ranch Road. <laughs> so in 93, I brought in uh, two tons, two and a half tons of grapes to, to Tony's facility. And we made the first wine. It was a prototype of something that we still make today, which is our North Coast Cabernet Franc. And the intent was to have something bright, fresh, something that worked work on Tuesday or Wednesday night. Um, I love it. I mean, now now your portfolio is still Cabernet Franc based, right. but what um, what are you making today? You don't have any estate fruit. You're sourcing, right? And so where are you sourcing from and what are you making? Well, with the Cabernet Franc, we, we produce two uh, styles. One, the North Coast, which is a, essentially a Vandelinet or wine of the year. And then the 214, which is a more of a Van de Garde or wine to age. Um, the North Coast is uh, an amalgam or an ensemble of about five, between five and seven different vineyards, each vintage, sourced predominantly now from Lake County with a little bit of Alexander Valley, Sonoma County, and a little bit of Napa blended in. So it's truly a winemaker's dream for me because I love to blend. I've been doing it for almost 40 years. Um, so I take the same grape, the same variety, I should say, from different terroir, different climates, uh, different clones, and hopefully come up with something that's greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. with, the, with the upper level wine, the 214, it is a single vineyard, single clone. So it is really more of an expression of a single vineyard that we have under contract. Mm, but you don't just do Cabernet Franc. Ah, uh, yes. Well, we always told people we only do Cabernet Franc, but we lied. Um, 20 years of 20 vintages, um, we finally decided after much thought, almost two decades of vintages, um, that we wanted to put our toe into the white wine business. And this was something that was an inspiration that came from my older son, Reed. Um, as a backup, Lang and Reed <clears throat> are the middle names of our two, our two boys, uh, John Reed Scupney and Jersey Lang Scupney. Um, Jersey goes by Jersey, Reed goes by Reed, so not to confuse <laughs> everyone, but Lang and Reed works. It's a lot better than Scupney. We're saving sure. that for a pickle company or something. <laughs> Anyways, Reed, um, 
the reluctant winemaker grew up, both the kids grew up here in St. Helena. And for St. Helena, or for Reed, St. Helena was too small a place. Great vines are boring, wine is boring, I gotta get out of here. It took him a couple of years to realize it was a beautiful place to grow up and live. And ultimately, he decided to take the path of winemaking. So he had worked at two different um, uh, wineries uh, before finishing his college career. Um, he worked at Pallmeyer and then in New Zealand. And after graduation from college, he went and worked at Domaine Baudry in Chinon. Family friends working in France for the 2008 harvest. His girlfriend and fiance at the time, Megan, uh, went along with him. And they spent one weekend out in Vouvray for the Fete de Vendage. And Megan totally fell in love with Shannon. So that put us on the path of not only trying to make something that Megan would really like to drink, uh, but to look at a grape that had been really lost in California. So what is your total case production? We're about 3,000 cases a year. Okay. It fluctuates between 2,500 and 4,000 cases, but on average, it's about 3,000 cases a year. So two Cabernet Francs, two Chenin Blancs. Right. And where are your wines available? Are they only direct to consumer? Are you available in all markets across the US? We're in about 35 different markets, um, predominantly restaurants. When you're making Cabernet Franc and Chenin Blanc, um, people will note that in retail stores, there's usually not a Franc or Shannon section. <laughs> so, but not by our design or nature, but about 75% of our wine is sold on restaurant wine lists and fine wine retailers, usually independents who can kind of hand sell things. And we do a risk business with direct to consumer people, uh, not only on uh, the internet, but at our salon here in St. Helena too. Mm. So John, I'm curious, what is your first memory relevant to wine? Oh, my very first memory probably was, you know, trying to figure out what that bottle of vermouth was about <laughs> sitting on in my dad's <laughs> liquor cabinet and maybe poaching a, a little sip or two and not particularly liking it. Uh -huh. but, my second one was my mother's bridge clubs when I was probably in third or fourth grade. And they would have these sort of swan looking bottles of silver satin. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it was made by Christian Brothers and it was very friendly. Uh -huh. It was a white, a friendly white wine. <laughs> Okay, when you move past friendly white wines, um, obviously you found a real love with Cabernet Franc, but I'm wondering, um, when we think back, and I'm sure you've had more than one, but one of those aha moments, was it a Cabernet Franc or was it a different wine? What was your, what was one of those original aha moments? Both Tracy and I came into the wine business through the restaurant trade, and um, so our and this was during the 70s, so our primary education was really in European wines. Mm -hmm. um, we were very fortunate in 1977 when we got married. We were in Switzerland and wound up spending a week in Bordeaux and a couple days in Champagne. Um, but it wasn't really until I got back to the States and I was working in Kansas City in restaurants. And I, the first definitive Cabernet Franc of the New World that I had, I believe, was in 1976. Mountain Beater Cabernet Franc, and it was probably from the Copla Vineyard. And I shared it with a guy who worked for Robert Mondavi Winery, who would come in to our restaurant every six weeks and do training for our management training group. And he spent his whole life on the road, and I we invited him to our house for dinner, and he was so touched that we would invite him in. And he knew all about the vineyard, and he knew all about you know, the Mount Beater and the, the the family that owned it at the time. So that was probably the, one of the first sparks in Cabernet Franc, hmm. done in a very different style than we make today. Hmm. So, uh, you know, traveling around the world, who do you think drinks the best in terms of quality? You mean people in the world drinking yeah, the best which, in quality? Which cultures? Do you think the US has it made or do you think another country uh, has better uh, Oh, I think Americans drink the best wines in the world because we're more, it's not something that we came up culturally with. So we came into it sort of in a, in a back doorway, really sort of the post-World War II era. And um, I mean, I, the, 
the benefit of friends for so many years. I, my son keeps asking me, well, what does Romani Conti taste like? <laughs> I said, well, it's really impossible to describe because there's nothing else that tastes like it. <laughs> and I'm not buying you a bottle. But, uh, through the generosity of friends, I've been able to taste so many of the great wines in the world. And in, in, in France and most parts in Europe, it's really much more provincial. They're very bright and understanding of the wines that are made in the neighborhood. Um, and except for uh, a few winemakers, and it's becoming much more global now, uh, but back to the Baudry's, um, they drink great Burgundies and are inspired by that, but yet they make Cabernet Franc and Chenin Blanc. Mm -hmm. um, so there's those little pockets, but I think Americans really consume most the best wine and, and unfortunately sometimes not really understanding what it's all about. Hmm. So if we come into your home, what sort of wines would we find in your cellar collection, under the bed, you know, wherever you hide those wines? <clears throat> well, I do have a pretty large cellar and it's, it's, it's kind of a resume of both Tracy's and my career. So we have a lot of old Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignons. We tend to I'll now even offer them to our son's friend's birth years because they're, <laughs> they're all getting a little long in the tooth. Um, but I drink, um, I drink other people's Cabernet Francs and other people's Chenin Blancs, but I do like, uh, I do like to find my bargains in white Burgundy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, everybody loves Pouligny Mon Rocher, but you kind of can't drink that on a Tuesday night. So if I can find an... <laughs> If I could find an Alagate or a, you know, a Bourgogne Blanc that's 17 to $30 and it's a cracking bottle of wine, I'll go back and buy six more. I think you can drink your white burgundy on a Tuesday night. Well, of course, if, if especially if somebody else is buying it. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, do you think there's such thing as a perfect variety? No, not particularly. I mean, there there used to be this thing of this is a noble white grape or this is a noble red grape. And I think there's a perfect moment for every variety. Um, and it's usually based upon an experiential thing or who you're drinking it with. Because everybody always says, well, what's the favorite wine you've ever had? And I always go, well, that would be really hard to pin down because it generally with somebody I really like being with or a moment and the smells and the sights around me that really amplify that. And that's why people oftentimes when they're visiting wine country, get home and they go, well, it really didn't taste the same. Well, you know, here you are, you're sitting in a spring sunshiny day, the flowers are all in bloom, you're all, you're relaxing and you're on vacation. Your mind's, you know, it's, it's your mind does It's not a Tuesday night. It is a Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you approach food and wine pairing? Um, you obviously are well versed in wines and um, I'm assuming you like your food too. So do you look at it as something to follow rules or are you more experimental or do you have any tips you can share? Oh, you know, I, I generally usually say if you have a corkscrew, use it, right? <laughs> and, um, and, and thinking about cuisine, we're, we're a family of people who cook. Um, I had great example from my father because he cooked. He helped my mom a lot. And my mom's a good cook too, but my dad could just throw together what he saw in the refrigerator. And so I'm a freelance, not a freelance, I'm a freelance chef. <laughs> and my best friend is the complete opposite. He brings out La Technique or he'll get, you know, cook's journal. I can't, I can't, I'm not a great baker mm -hmm. because to be a great baker, you it really have to follow. Right. And again, I'm, all, I'm pretty, you know, right brain having gone to art school. So I too can open up the refrigerator and sort of make a dinner from nothing. <laughs> as far as pairing, I think um, some people need those guidelines. Um, I never colored within the, you know, within the lines. <laughs> My mother doesn't either. <laughs> um, the, uh, and so I'm, I'm not particularly didactic about, you know, white wine with fish and red wine with meat. Um, Cabernet Franc, uh, fortunately, has a wide swath of compatibility because of generally the lower tannin levels that exist in it. Mm -hmm. And the little bit of herbaceousness tends to go with things with herbs and also vegetables. So we're really lucky. I mean, I, Tracy and I, you know, oftentimes we'll, in the summertime in particular, if I do grilled salmon outdoors, 
Uh, North Coast Cabernet Franc directly from the cellar at 60 or 65 degrees is perfect. Hmm. Um, if I don't have a nice bottle of Chenin Blanc or <laughs> Sauvignon Blanc already chilled. <laughs> That's um, true. And so too, um, there are real classic uh, matches. We make two different, Caber or two different Chenin Blancs, one from Mendocino and one from Napa Valley. And the Mendocino is definitely the more forward, you know, sort of saline, uh, slake a thirst kind of wine that is perfect with, you know, with raw, you know, oysters and shellfish and that sort of thing. The Napa is a little more brooding. It's a little more quiet. And you, I always think of sort of roasted quail with a cream sauce on top. Mm. Mm. Um, so, you know, there are those sort of perfect matches, but truth is, you know, any wine has acid in it, has enough acid in it to clear your palate for the next bite is generally going to work. Hmm. I still haven't figured out artichokes, but I don't think anybody does. <laughs> so you may not have figured artichokes out, but have you figured out wine critics and scores? What do you think your, what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, you know, it, I know many of them. In fact, many of them I've known personally and, and seen their families grow. It's 40 years on the supply side and another five years in the restaurants before then. And it's always a classic conflict between the critic and the artists. And um, scores, you know, it's I love them when they're good, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm never insulted by somebody's review uh, if I really, if I really think they understood the wine. But when you're making something quirky like Franck, you kind of have to realize that it's an accumulative amount of uh, of reviews or critiques that add up to the greater part, because there are generally some really big and important critics out there, wine critics who I don't really think they uh, totally understand the variety. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ones who totally get it. Um, so, you know, I don't necessarily pick and choose, but um, I love it when it's great. And I'm, you know, I'm t it's like telling you when it's not good, it's like somebody insulting your child. You know? oh. So, well, tell me something, mm -hmm. quick answer. Okay. Red, white or rosé? First white, um, I, and that's just recent, in the last five yeah. years. Um, I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm, maybe it was the, the, uh, a spinoff of the exploration of figuring out Chenin Blanc, but yeah. I now drink more white wines than I do red. Still or sparkling? Oh, well, <laughs> when I'm with my wife, it's sparkling for sure, with it's, with it's me. If it's only a half bottle sparkling in the refrigerator, I'll open, <laughs> I'll open my own bottle of white. <laughs> So for somebody who hasn't had the pleasure to taste your wines yet, what do you think they're missing out on? Um, I think they're missing out on uh, a kind of nice little segment of the wine business. We have always tried to make our wines really approachable and, and you know, I, I've always thought that good wine shouldn't hurt. Um, I have always tried to seek balance and elegance over power and extract. So some people might find them not as rich or overwhelming as a lot of the confers in my neck, in my neck of the woods. Um, I worked for mostly Napa Valley wineries that were on the bench lands or on the valley as opposed to hillside. So I consider myself a valley boy. <laughs> um, I, I worked for Claude Duval for four years. I think the level of elegance that I learned about wines and the, and the and the sort of quiet complexity that can exist in a wine is more important to me than mm -hmm. sheer power. Um, it, it'd be like uh, something, wine being part of a, 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 a quartet. You've got food, you've got friends, you've got the environment, and you've got the wine. And the wine shouldn't stand out so, unless it's a special occasion and where you've been saving something for a long time. It should be an integral part of that of that element of that quartet, whether or not it be a jazz quartet or a you know classical quartet. Hmm. So for some, so if space aliens mm -hmm. were to land on your property, come here to your lovely tasting room and in Saint Helena, which of your wines would you want to welcome them with? If I could only pick one of them, I would do the North Coast uh, Cabernet Franc, okay. and it is our signature wine. Uh, we still make it in what we consider a fairly reasonable price zone. 
Um, I'm not really an old hippie, but growing up being an artist, you understood the, what frugality meant. Mm -hmm. And I like to make wines that I can still afford myself today. So the alien is probably not coming down with Bitcoin. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd expect it was pocket change. And you could probably get a bottle or a half bottle of the frog for that. So John, how much time do you spend in each of the vineyards that you're sourcing from? Are you in there on a regular basis or checking in a little bit here and there? Um, a little less now than I used to, uh, simply because I really have a sense of trust in the people who do this for us. Mm -hmm. um, I start, I always do an early sp early spring, I always do a mid-spring, like within, before June 5th, I'll go to each of the vineyards just to see what the bloom and set looks like, because Franck is in mid-bloom right now, Merlot's almost done, Cabernet Sauvignon's about to start. Um, I live on a vineyard that's Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon in the back west side of St. Helena that I walk. I should do it every day, but it's about three times a week. So I can monitor from those vineyards where the relative points that the vineyards that we work with are. Hmm. Um, so I'll start, I'll go see them f within the next two weeks and then every two weeks after that. And then once we hit August, it'll be every week. And then once the grapes come in and they're in your care in the winery and you put them into barrels and they're, they're spending their time, do you talk to your wine? Do you have, a, do you have a, a personal relationship with it? Or are you playing music for it? Or is it just a very uh, silent, uh, more ethereal relationship? Um, I'm in a very quiet spot in the Laird family estate. I'm in the North Shea. And it's, it's sort of cathedral-like. I don't play music in there anymore. When I first started, when, when I was at Etude, we always were playing jazz um, in the background. I think it was Tony Soder's um, sort of gig. And then I was at Luna in Custom Crush, and John Consgard was the the major domo there. I had never had any idea that my wine would be made to Wagner. I mean, <laughs> when I when I brought yeast, did in, it taste different? Well, you know, it, I, it did taste different than the one that came up with, you know, with uh, 10 years after in traffic. <laughs> there was a little bit of difference. Too. <laughs> so when you were a little boy, what did you want to be when you grew up? Um, well, I did want to be an artist. My mom was a painter. She still is today at 94 years old. She still does artwork every single day. Um, that was one thing. I also wanted to be a marine biologist because when I was like in fourth grade, my dad took me to see a, a in-person lecture with Jacques Cousteau. So I thought that was pretty good. Uh, it was interesting that what Jacques had once said was that, uh, that actually led me into the culinary world was he, he said that the, the shark is a more efficient uh, killer than the American housewife. <laughs> <laughs> And it was the way our food handling went. So <laughs> suddenly that struck me and I thought, oh, maybe I'll be I got bit by the culinary bug because I worked in restaurants from the time I was a teen. So. Mm -hmm. And when you're not working, how do you, how do you spend your free time? Um, I actually do a fair amount of reading. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge book reader, but when I do, I sort of like can't do anything else. But I read journals. Um, I, we live here in St. Helena, so I have a big backyard that needs a lot of tending. Um, I have two, I have three grandchildren now, a new one that's three months old and then... Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Seven-year-old uh, granddaughter and a five-year-old grandson. So that occupies, you know, a lot of weekends because we try to give the kids as much coverage as possible. Sure. Uh, both Tracy and I have been involved in volunteer work in Napa Valley. My parents were superstar volunteer, uh, volunteer ease. Both Tracy and I are more involved in sort of the business realms of volunteerism. Uh, both of us have been on the board of directors of the Napa Valley Vintners. I was the chairman in 96. Um, so those are the kind of things what occupy us. A little bit of travel, not as much as I would like to, but uh, yeah. Yeah. we'll see. We'll see. So when you're planning a romantic evening for you and Tracy, what sort of wines are involved in a romantic evening other than bubbles? Because I do understand that that is uh, what you mentioned is her choice, but. Well, it really, it is really predicated on that. Um, <laughs> it just depends on the size of the bottle, you know. I mean? <laughs> uh, when we've entertained with friends and, and then ultimately wind up with a romantic evening, it's, it's usually a bottle of bubbles and maybe a burgundy. Mm -hmm. 
We do drink more Pinot Noir now than we did in the early days because we're not necessarily as involved in the sort of Cabernet Sauvignon uh, world in Napa Valley that we were once. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So when you um, look back at your life and, you know, you we've been given advice, tons of advice throughout our childhoods and our adulthoods. Is there a piece of advice that you like to uh, apply to your life today that you feel that is something that has guided you through the years? It could, or maybe just in your business, you know, it could be a short little fun little bit or a real life changing piece of advice. Ooh, that's hard. Um, well, I could probably, if, I, if it was Venice uh, advice that I can apply to you know, the day, my daily thing is uh, Dick Ward, who was one of my mentors and the, one of the two co-founders of Sainsbury, um, and not an anti-Cabernet Sauvignon, but he understood, he had a different feel about Cabernet Franc going into it than I did. Is uh, He told me, he said, you know, uh, it's okay to have great, he said, great, you can see through great wine. It doesn't need to be opaque. And so I think that sense of transparency uh, that he talked about, the sort of luminescence when you're looking into a wine, um, it gave me the ability to sort of look at it in a different way than I had been taught beforehand. And, and to that, it sort of things that I can apply to life. It isn't so, it isn't just that. It's, there's, there's more story to it. Hmm. Hmm. So when you look back at your career, what would you say is one of your proudest achievements to date? Well, I, besides my children. Well, uh, I said career. Oh, career. <laughs> Specifically, because I always know that children are the proudest accomplishments. But outside of the family. Um, I think it's the joy when I go to a restaurant, whether or not it's a, you know, a bar with sawdust on the floor or Spago in Beverly Hills and see our wine on the wine list and to know that um, we've, when you make Cabernet Franc and Blanc, it's a Sisyphe, it, it, it's like Sisyphus. You roll this rock up the hill and right when you think it's going to be the next big thing, um, Grenache will be invented or, <laughs> <laughs> or you know, you know, uh, Gruner takes over or, but, you know, Dan Duckhorn, who was also one of my mentors along with Dick, um, always said, whatever you make, make sure you have a passion for that particular grape and, and make it with all your might and people will figure it out. Oh. And uh, so that's what I did. And I was out of his playbook because he did Merlot only for like five or 10 years and became the Merlot king. And in our first business plan, our, you know, our goals was, you know, to be- The Cabernet Franc king? One of the top 10 Cabernet Francs in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, some days, I feel like we've achieved that in other days when people say, oh, I've never heard of you. I think, well, okay, <laughs> we still have room to grow. <laughs> so complete the sentence for me. Okay. A table without wine is like? Uh, an empty seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of empty seats, <laughs> nice segue. Um, we're sitting around a table right? and we've got, we literally are sitting around a table. The Lang and Reed bottles are on the table, literally, yeah. but um, figuratively, we're sitting around a table and there is an empty seat at that table. Who from any walk of life, living or deceased, famous or personal, would you like to be sharing a bottle of uh, Lang and Reed, who you'd love to see drinking Lang and Reed? Ooh, boy, that'd be a tough one. Uh, it'd probably be, oh, somebody unknown, probably uh, Charlie Parker. Uh, I don't know, just to understand the, the sheer genius that he had and, and see if he would get, you know, what, the same way he plays Laura, the, I play the, the same way that I do Cabernet Franc, maybe. Ooh, ooh, I like that. Hmm. So if you were sent off to a deserted island, you can take Tracy with you, but what three bottles would you take with you? Oh, three bottles, three bottles, is that all? 
Well, I'd take a, uh, a Methuselah of <laughs> Baudry's uh, uh, Clos de Guillot, uh, my favorite. It's not their biggest or most expressive wine, but it's just the little darling. Um, I would take at least a double magnum of um, La Mondier bubbles for my wife. And probably, um, I think an Ouet uh, Molyu. I drank a bottle on my 65th birthday. Um, I was bequeathed a bottle of 1953 Ouet Vouvray. Um, we drank it at Mustard's and shared it with the table next to us because Cindy Paulson was there with John Consgard and Maggie <laughs> and, and uh, Carl Domini. That's not just really, a normal table next yeah, to you. <laughs> I didn't really want to share. But <laughs> Uh, and it was just beyond my expectations. I've had red wines dated back to the 1700s and nothing stood the test of time and the two hours that we sat on that bottle of wine as that 53 you had. Mm. Uh, the power of a 65 year old bottle of white wine. Mm. Mm. Wow. I'd take a Jeroboam of that. <laughs> <laughs> well. We're almost finished. It's time for our little game on Wine Soundtrack, pairing okay. wine with music. Um, you know, I'm curious, you make four wines. Right. And I'm wondering if you can do this with your four wines because, you know, I normally would say to someone, oh, Chenin Blanc and Cab Franc, but you've got two Chenin Blancs and two Cab Francs, which you've described with very different styles. Sure. So if we started with your first Chenin Blanc, the one that I've been sipping on, which is the one from Mendocino. Right. What kind of music does that inspire you to listen to or does the song remind you of? It can be a, a genre, a musician, a specific song. Um, I think it would be sort of, <clears throat> you know, maybe a little bit of high tone <clears throat> Latin jazz or Latin rock and roll. Maybe a maybe when Santana did all his big cover thing with all those other artists, mm -hmm. um, but the really high lifting ones, not the black magic woman, but, right. uh, you know, sort of the ones that sort of danced around. Uh, and what about the Napa Chenin Blanc? That's a little more ponderous, um, uh, like, like Bill Evans, mm -hmm. you know, very quiet, uh, beautiful piano music, something that sneaks up on you, it's beauty, you know. Mm. And then moving on to Cabernet Franc, starting with your North Coast Cabernet Franc. Oh, that's, oh gosh. Um, <clears throat> that's a tough one. Um, it's got to be up there. It's got to be moving. Um, I would, it, not really Eric Clapton, maybe, uh, uh, maybe traffic, you know. So one of their really bright ones with a lot of, you know, the old fashioned electric piano to bring the heights up. Ah. And then last but not least, your Cabernet Franc 214. A ballad by Miles Davis, definitely. Hmm. Nicely oh. done. Four wines, two varieties, four songs. I like it. <laughs> so, John, I have a question for you. Okay. Two parts. First is... What wine region in the world is at the top of your bucket list to go explore? Oh, there's only three. <laughs> you only have a list of three? Yeah, right now. Oh, I, you can tell us all three then. I'd like to go to South Africa. Okay. Um, it's, I just don't want to be in a plane that long. Um, <laughs> I've never been in the Southern Hemisphere. My boys both lived and worked in, in New Zealand. Uh, but South Africa, and not only for the curiosity for... Um, for Chenin Blanc, but before apartheid, I actually got to know a lot of uh, South African wines in the in the trade, and then suddenly for 25 years, the only time I got to drink them was in a, when I was in London. Um, and if I look at any one wine growing region in the last 20 years that's gone through a metamorphosis, South Africa has. Hmm. Um, to not name all the places, but the other one, I have been to Burgundy but it's always been on a professional level. And I've gone to a few of the really fabulous places. I would like to go there for a couple of weeks and not go to every winery, just to, like we did on our first trip to Chinon, we were there for five weeks. 
and pretty much Tracy only let me go to one winery a week. And so I had to pick which one I wanted to go to. And each of those wineries that I've gone, that I went to on that trip in 1997, I'm still connected with those people. Mm -hmm. And so it was an, an immersion as opposed to a staccato thing. So you want to visit South Africa yep. and you want to immerse yourself in Burgundy, but you said there were only three on your list. So you might as well mention the third one. New Zealand. Okay. I'd want to know what it, how did they make a transition from really changing Sauvignon Blanc in the world and even teaching the, the people in the Loire how to properly do it? Hmm. And how did they make this transition to really make some really cool Pinot Noirs? I don't hmm. know. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, what about people that want to come here? If they want to come visit you here and taste Lang and Reed and taste not your typical Napa wines, taste a Chenin Blanc and a Cabernet Franc, not a Chardonnay and a Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, they're in for a real treat, but how can they find you and what's a, what's what are their options? Well, we've just started to, uh, we, in a space and place that we've been involved with since the early aughts, we just took over this beautiful old house. It's called the Spring House. It was built in 1902 by uh, Batista and, uh, Batista and, I uh, forget her name, but, uh, uh, Salmina and the Salmina family were uh, Italian Swiss from Ticino and they owned the William Tell Hotel next door and they also started Larkmead Vineyards. So it's a beautiful step back in history. It's a, one block off the of main street in St. Helena. It's a perfect place to come to right before lunch or right after. It's a sorbet between Cabernet Sauvignon and Chardonnay. Mm. <laughs> we have a beautiful salon here. Um, you can sort of pretend you live in St. Helena for maybe an hour, hour and a half. Absolutely. And taste and, our wines. And, and just make an appointment? Yeah. Of course, langandreed.com. Um, you look in, under the salon or visitations, and we have four private rooms here, and we don't book more than, we never double book. It's always sort of one on one. And at this stage, um, it's myself hosting, my wife Tracy, and my daughter in law. So it's going to be one of three family members who will host you. So you get a really personal visit and you're right across the street from Goose and Gander, a fantag fantabulous yeah. restaurant with um, great duck fat fries, which yeah. probably would go really well with your wine. So. <laughs> and you so, add in the mushroom soup with the frog. That's a win. <laughs> so it's a perfect combination. You right. can have some great wine, but um, John, thank you so much for joining us on thank Wine you. Soundtrack. I hope you had fun and thanks for I sharing did. your story. It is <laughs> some good and provocative questions. <laughs> Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.